we do this. Well, what is a phone? Okay. Right, let me just get my stuff here. Good afternoon, and welcome to this second lecture in the History Department's series of public lectures, Thinking with the Past. I'm Michael Katz. I'm the interim chair of the History Department. And uh, tonight's uh, lecture, uh, as you know, is by Professor David Ruderman. The third and final lecture in our series will be on uh, April 12th uh, by Professor Stephanie McCurry. The title of the lecture is Confederate uh, Reckoning. Um, David's uh, book on uh, early modern Jewry is uh, for sale, lots of copies up at the back of the room uh, for after, after the event. The purpose of this series is to bring uh, the excite, some of the exciting scholarship that goes on in the Penn's history department to a wider, to a wider audience. And I'm delighted to see uh, so many people here who uh, have come uh, who are not uh, uh, based, based on campus. It's, it's just wonderful. And it's also, these lectures reflect our, um, our belief that history is not merely some kind of antiquarian undertaking, but a really vital, vibrant way of, um, of knowing, a way of, of, of using, uh, using scholarships to understand who we are in time. Um, and certainly, uh, David is a wonderful person, um, is a wonderful person to, to do this for us. To introduce him, I'd like to call on Arthur Kieron. Arthur is the Schottstein Jesselton Jesselson Curator of Judaica Collections and Interim Coordinator of Area Studies Collection at the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. Arthur. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Well, this is a, a great honor uh, and um, an unexpected honor to introduce uh, my dear friend, uh, really an exceptional, extraordinary scholar that, um, that we all know in a variety of different ways. Uh, I want to quickly um, tell you some of the, the facts as they were, and then I'll just make a couple um, quick remarks and then turn over to the speaker. Uh, David Ruderman is the Joseph Meyerhoff Professor of Modern Jewish History and the Ella Derevoff Director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Those names of all those institutions and positions are part of David's uh, extraordinary legacy in building Jewish studies and Jewish history here at the University of Pennsylvania. Before coming to Penn, David taught at the U University of Maryland and at Yale University until 1994. He's the author of, of numerous books and articles, including The World of a Renaissance Jew, uh, Kabbalah, Magic and Science, A Valley of Vision, Jewish Thought and Scientific Discovery in Early Modern Europe, uh, and uh, Jewish Enlightenment in an English Key, anglo Jewry's Construction of Modern Jewish Thought, Connecting the Covenants, Judaism and the Search for Jewish Identity in 18th Century England, and the book he'll be speaking about today, um, a chapter from it, Early Modern Jewry, A New Cultural History, 2010. Uh, I want to show you these books, the ones that have been just written or produced in the last 10 years, because these have been produced while David has also held this chair in the history department, but he's also been the director, as you heard, of the Katz Center. And this kind of um, prolific output is really extraordinary under any circumstances, but to have serious works of scholarship appear in the course of having so many different kinds of administrative responsibilities is, is really exceptional. Um, David is the past president of the American Academy for Jewish Research and has produced um, two of his Jewish history courses which are available uh, for sale uh, with the teaching company. And in 2001, he received the National Foundation for Jewish Culture a uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in, in this field. Uh, I just want to make three very short remarks that I think are important to understand beyond the scholar, um, beyond the administrator and the community leader, um, which is this word community. Uh, for David, there, and this, for this program, I think he's, he's the most appropriate speaker in a way because of his deep commitment to community. 
Uh, for David, the walls of the university are not, um, are not uh, unbroken. There is continuity of movement between uh, the, the town and the gown, and uh, David is really exemplary of that relationship. Uh, secondly, for David, scholarship is about a conversation. My second C, community and conversation. And that conversation is something truly remarkable in, the, in scholarship. This book, which is available, as they said, back in, in the back uh, for, for you to purchase, Early Modern Jewelry, is a conversation. This is something that David, one of the, the senior scholars in the field, has written a book that at this point people would say it's the final word on a topic. This is really the opening salvo, the beginning of a conversation. And scholarship that opens up conversations and connects people is really something special. And finally, I want to throw in one more C word, and that word is courage. Because a book like this, David's work is, 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 is filled with original research. This is a synthetic work that opened David up to a, a lot of criticism. But David knew the criticism in advance. And he felt for his students, for you, for the community, and for, for the field that there should be a, 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 a point where people could stop and reflect on the meaning of an early modern Jewry. And this book really is that the result of that commitment to uh, scholarship. So without further ado, I want to introduce my dear friend, uh, the scholar and um, David Ruderman. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's totally exaggerated, Arthur, and uh, I'll pay you afterwards for that. Um, it's really a, an honor to be here and to be picked by uh, my wonderful chair, uh, Michael, to give one of these three lectures with my distinguished colleagues. I want to thank Michael in particular for conceiving this idea and Peter Holquist for actually carrying it out. Uh, and uh, any other colleagues who were involved in the process. Um, it is a wonderful way of linking the history department with the greater community. Uh, and in my case, I really feel that that community is here. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, I, uh, w he, he had three C's for me. I want to add an F after the C's. Uh, foolhardy. Um, Anyone that would dare to speak about the history of print in front of my colleague Roger Chartier uh, has to be stupid. Uh, so uh, maybe that's an S. Anyway, so uh, uh, you'll forgive me. And I, in, in order to sort of prepare myself for, um, I have to sort of overcome my anxiety here. So you don't want, let me go through this for just a minute or two. Um, uh, in the Renaissance period that I began my career in, um, and I was actually uh, teaching this a little bit to uh, one of my students is here, I see in the back. Um, you, you begin uh, the Renaissance uh, sermon with an exordium. Uh, or, you know, uh, an exordium is basically to present your own credentials um, and to somehow prepare your audience so that they will accept your words. Uh, in many cases, exordia uh, really talk about your own humility, which, of course, I have plenty of. Uh, and, um, and also talk about uh, your uh, limitations and your deficits so that, uh, you know, and, and also plead not, not to attack me too bitterly. So uh, I, I thought, I, I usually don't use it, but when Roger is sitting here, I, I need an exordium to begin with. So that's, that's the beginning of this. And it does have to do with something with the book, so therefore I thought it was appropriate. Um, I'm really not an historian of the book, um, and I see my role here uh, just being around Penn for so many years and absorbing from the history of the book seminar itself, but also a glorious year uh, at our center where we brought uh, uh, the, the, the trinity, I call them, it was Roger, uh, Peter Stallybrass, and Tony Grafton sat every week and talked to my Jewish historians of the book. Uh, that was one of the most glorious uh, uh, years of the center, uh, and of course I learned a great deal from that. Another way I've learned about the history of the book is that almost all of my own graduate students at Penn have availed themselves of studying either with Peter or Roger, and uh, in other words, their interest in the book has become much more professional than mine. So that is really the greatness of Jewish studies within the context of the university. Uh, the ability to, to integrate and to bring people from the outside into this fruitful conversation dialogue 
uh, which then allows them to see their own subject from a totally different vantage point. Uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, to use uh, an, evoke another name. Uh, I'm a kind of Rashi. Uh, Rashi, I'm not referring to the guy that played for the New York Yankees. I'm referring, uh, which Peter probably remembers, but um, I'm referring uh, to an 11th century commentator uh, on the Bible and the Talmud uh, from uh, um, uh, northern France, um, whose primary role as an educator was to simplify, to take material from diverse locations and to organize in a way in which he became the ultimate, the quintessential uh, uh, pedagogue of the Jewish experience. You cannot read the Bible from a Jewish point of view anymore without Rashi uh, or, and certainly not the Talmud. Uh, and therefore, my role here is a kind of Rashi introduction to this kind of vast subject of the history of the book. Um, not only has there been a lot of work on the subject recently within Jewish scholarship, of course, the subject of the history of the book has, has already a long history, uh, beginning even before Elizabeth Eisenstein. Uh, but Jewish historians are catching up, and there are now seminars run, one in New York, where the history of the book is discussed on a regular basis. Of interest not only to non-historians is this subject as well. Primarily because we live in the age of Twitter, uh, internet, iPhone, and the like. Uh, and as we are aware, particularly uh, those who are a little bit older, of the radical change in the way we went about our business uh, years ago and the way we do it now because of the computer and because of the new technology, might suggest in place, uh, might, might suggest indeed that understanding the history of the book and the print and the technology of print as it emerged in the 15th century and after is indeed a parallel to our own universe. There are obviously major differences. But here, technology is such an important dimension in the way we understand each other and the way we function as a cultural experience. Um, I'm reminded, uh, I saw this, uh, I don't know where I saw this cartoon. But it's a lovely cartoon, and since uh, I'm talking about the larger culture and technology, I can't help but relate it. Um, it's a cartoon which has a grandmother in it who, with her two grandchildren. Uh, one is 11 years old and one is 8. Does anyone ever know what I'm talking about here? And uh, she is lamenting the fact that she had just read in the newspaper that Saturday mail delivery is going to stop. Uh, and she turns to the 11-year-old and she said, isn't that horrible? Uh, and he said, what is mail? He asked the question, what is mail? And then she turns to the eight-year-old who says, what is a newspaper? Um, so again, I mean, just a, a wonderful indication of, uh, of to what degree technology moves at such a rapid rate uh, and transforms us. From the point of view of Jewish culture, uh, this subject is also quite relevant. Uh, why did Jews gather, or at least some of them, gather every Saturday morning and open an ark and address a scroll. Why a scroll? I mean, we have printed books, we have codexes, we have books, uh, we have, uh, my, we have uh, uh, computer screens. What is the purpose of the scroll within that ceremony? And why, just, and I'm not gonna answer any of these questions, I'm just gonna ask them, why uh, of the great uh, books that are read in the course of the year, is there primarily a scroll only for uh, the scroll of Esther? which is used, of course, is illustrated and so on. So the holiday of Purim is also known for reading from a scroll. Why a scroll? In other words, these questions obviously uh, are significant and relevant to understanding uh, the emergence, the evolution of Jewish culture over time. And what historians have been doing, of course, is comparing the Jewish experience with that of Christian Islam and trying to understand how, indeed, uh, the transformation from the scroll to the codex to the printed book has had its impact on the way under people understand uh, their own cultural experience. Now I want to speak primarily about the early modern period and I want to speak about the history of the Jewish book as it emerges in the 15th century uh, and uh, I of course can't do such a vast subject in a few minutes. Uh, what I intend to do is to speak primarily about four books. Uh, and even I, who never works with PowerPoint, I was going to try to do a very, very simple, simple presentation of PowerPoint. It goes along with the simplicity of my lecture, the simplicity of my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so I'm going to speak about four books. Two at the beginning, and then some commentary in between, 
And then I want to close with two books. Um, those of you who have heard me before, uh, you will you pr probably have heard of one of, or two of these books. I think in a history presentation a couple of years ago, I spoke about one of them. Uh, I know I spoke to the Orthodox Jewish community at, uh, um, at Penn uh, about uh, one of these books as well, but from a totally different perspective. Um, and I'm going to show you what they look like, and we're going to talk about them and use these as illustrations of what I consider to be a major element of early modern Jewish culture. Now, before I start, a word about early modern Jewish culture. Arthur mentioned this book, and I'm totally embarrassed that not only he, but Michael said you should buy it. Uh, you know, you can if you want, but uh, I'd give it to you if I could afford to buy it for all of you. But um, I, wasn't, I didn't come here to sell books, even though uh, I guess that's what we're doing. Um, in any case, uh, the book is, as Arthur described, an attempt really based on my teaching for many years to try to explain what is the rationale of dealing only with this period, what is unique about this period from the point of view of Jewish cultural history. In this book, I define five factors. I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them now. Uh, maybe I'll just mention one, oh, the one and then the one that is relevant here. Uh, the first is mobility of people, uh, both because of expulsions and also because of individual wandering. Again, not a unique characteristic of Jewish experience, but Jews are indeed, as we know from that image of the wandering Jew, the quintessential wandering people, and in this, people, in this age, indeed, they are in constant movement, Jews on the move, as the chapter is called. Along with the mobility of people is the mobility of books, and that's really what I want to speak about here. How do books, or the, the creation of the printing press, and the ultimate publication of hundreds of Hebrew books and Yiddish books and Ladino books, how does this transform the nature of Jewish cultural experience? Uh, so indeed, this subject is part of a larger subject. There are other elements as well, but it seems to me that one of the characteristics of this age, as opposed to the medieval period or the ancient period, is the printed book and the way it works to integrate uh, Jewish culture in a very new way. And I'm going to speak about that way, uh, that, that way momentarily. All right, I think we are ready then to begin. That was a long introduction. My first image, uh, and let's see, get this straight here. Wow, look, I'm so far I'm right. Gee. Uh, all right. Um, what you are looking at uh, is called in Hebrew the Mikrot Gedolot. Um, it is a rabbinic Bible. And it is published by Daniel Bomborg. Uh, Bomborg was a Christian printer from Antwerp who came down to Venice and became probably the most important printer of uh, Hebrew books um, in uh, Venice in the first decades, <coughs> actually through the first half of, of the 16th century. His two greatest creations, and there are many, is the Talmud. The first Talmud is the printed Talmud of Bamburg, <coughs> and uh, the Mikrot Gedolot, the Rabbinic Bible. <coughs> what I love to do, particularly with my students, many of them are, uh, come from yeshiva backgrounds, is to bring them into the rare book room of our library <coughs> and to pull out the Bamburg Talmud, or in this case the Mikrot Gedolot, either one, and I said, okay, this is what you have studied all of your life. Is this what God gave Moses on Sinai? And if it's not, then how did it get to be like this? Um, and they have to think about that question. You see how historians are so subversive. Uh, but isn't, you know, the Talmud, the Shas, I mean, the, 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 this text in the middle with, with commentaries on the side, isn't that the, what you would think of as being ultimately the most Jewish thing in the world? Well, in fact, uh, it is uh, created by a Christian printer, uh, who uh, was modeling himself after the Gloss Ordinaire, in other words, after the way that canon law is produced. And indeed, it is a product of the technology of print to take the text of the Bible. Uh, in this case, um, what am I looking at here? I can't see it from this side. I guess I should look it over <laughs> over there. But this is uh, Parshat Mishpatim. There is Rashi's commentary, the guy I mentioned now, you know who he is. And there is Ibn Ezra on the left. And this is from the Book of Kings. Uh, and there is Rashi again, and there is Radak, Radak. Uh, and these are all medieval commentators. There are manuscripts that exist with the biblical text and Rashi's commentary. But I've never seen manuscripts where you can put simultaneously several commentaries on one page and surround them. So you can read the biblical text. You can also read the Aramaic text, which is right next to it. 
Uh, and then you can go right to the commentaries. What's interesting about the commentaries is that while Rashi is a Jew from Northern Europe, what we call an Ashkenazic Jew, um, Ibn Ezra and Radak are Sephardic guys. That is, they come from Spain. That is an important part of our story. Radak is Rabbi David Kimchi, 12th century exeget. Uh, Ibn Ezra also 12th century. So these were the classic medieval commentators who, by the way, because of their place on this page, became known also to Christian Hebraists. And they are quoted all over the place. Rashi, Ibn Ezra, those are the big three. Those were the trinity of their own uh, generation. Um, now, what is unusual about this text is that, number one, it was printed by Christians with Jews, helping them, of course. Um, but immediately after it is produced, it starts selling into the Ottoman Empire, into the, Jews of, the Jewish communities of Italy. And most interestingly, it reaches Eastern Europe. It goes across the borders into Eastern Europe, into the largest Jewish community that is emerging in Poland, Lithuania in the 16th and the 17th century. And there they get this book, and they said, what are we going to do with this book? Jews traditionally don't sit and read Bible. That's what you do when you're five years old. But you don't read Torah. You don't read uh, Bible or Tanakh. Uh, you, you read the Talmud. And in the Talmud are embedded all kinds of biblical pesukim, uh, verses. And thus you learn your Bible by studying the Talmud. But you only learn it indirectly. Why study it frontally in this way? And, and certainly adults don't do that. That's something that kids do. Moreover, who are these guys, Radak and Ibn Ezra? They're not us. We never heard of these guys. These are guys from far off Spain. One of the most interesting characteristics of the early modern period for Jews is not only Jews interacting with Christians and Muslims, which is obviously a major part of our story, but of course that goes on in other periods as well. What is interesting is that Jews are meeting other Jews as a result of the expulsion from Spain in 1492 as a result of the migration of Jews from Central Europe into Eastern Europe, beginning in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, with the large immigration of Jews to the Ottoman Empire and to Italy, and going north, uh, south to north, uh, west to, uh, to east, what we see is the mixing of Jewish populations. And not only the mixing of Jewish populations, but the mixing of Jewish books. In other words, this book arrives in Eastern Europe, and indeed, there are discussions about it. Uh, we hear through the wonderful work of uh, Elhan Reiner, who I have to mention in regard to this book and in the next book, um, we understand that for a number of Eastern European rabbis, this is problematic. First of all, why study the Torah so directly? And second of all, why are we reading guys that are not really part of our own nation? We never heard of these guys. They are Jews from far off. And therefore, uh, we don't want to accept them or take them seriously. And indeed, there is a controversy about this. There's another controversy that goes on as well over another interesting text written in the 12th century. And that is, of course, Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed, the great work of Jewish philosophy. In this case, uh, why would Jews be debating this in the 16th century? That's a kind of belated response to Maimonides. But indeed, it is about the printing of Maimonides in Eastern Europe. Who, what are we reading here? Should we be studying this in the Shivot, in the academies of Jewish learning in Eastern Europe, and not the Talmud, Maimonides' Guide? So what is interesting here is a resurgence of interest both in medieval philosophy and in medieval science, and in reading the Bible and its commentators in this way. Radak and Ibn Ezra also are part of that same philosophical tradition. They are rationalists. Uh, they are interested in interpreting the Bible metaphorically. Uh, they are also interested in bringing in astrology and astronomy and a variety of subjects that for some Eastern European Jews, uh, they, this was far from their particular context. All right, so that's my first example. I'm going to say more about that in a second, but uh, that's just to get you started. All right, now i got to learn how to go to the second thing here. Um, uh -huh. All right. So the second book I want to talk about <clears throat> is my friend Yosef Karo. Uh, but I'm looking at a special edition of this book. The Shulchan Aruch, called in English the Ordered Table, is the standard code of Jewish law, written by a Sephardic Jew named Yosef Karo, who left Spain, made his way across the Ottoman Empire, and eventually settled in Safed, in Sfat, in Palestine, in the early 16th century. What he does is to create a code of Jewish law that is published in Venice 
in a several editions before this edition. Why do I use this edition, Krakow 1578? Because it has an edition that is very important, an edition, I said edition before, but now I'm saying addition, and that is the edition of another rabbi's commentary called Moses Isserlis, the great rabbi of Krakow. What we have here from 1578 on, and in every edition of the Shulchan Aruch, the two appear together, is a Sephardic code digest of Jewish law on the one hand, and on the other hand, a commentary written by an Ashkenazic Jew to supplement, to embellish, to make kosher, so to speak, the Sephardic uh, uh, text of Cairo. Cairo is a very interesting figure. Cairo is also a mystic. Cairo spoke to angels all the time. He left us a, uh, a book in which he describes his, his journeys in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in his fantasy world, so to speak. Uh, but he was also a codifier. Uh, isn't that beautiful? Something about the Jewish tradition. You can be a, a crazy mystic, and at the same time, you can be also a very sober a codifier. And somehow the two need to work together. Exactly how they work, I don't think anyone has figured it out. We have a wonderful book by Tzvi Verblowski that talks about his dreams. But uh, he doesn't suggest how, in fact, the dreams interface with this very rational act of taking all of Jewish law, codifying it, closing it, so that now every Jew knows what the law is and can follow the divine will. Now, Israelis' act is also as um, exciting and as audacious as that of Cairo, because he was part of an Ashkenazic tradition, which was basically an oral tradition. That is, in the yeshivot, in the academies of Jewish learning in Eastern Europe, a rabbi would teach a class, usually from a manuscript. And there he would add his, what are called, hasagot. And here are the hasagot of Israelis, for, or at least the introduction to Israelis. There is Ele Divri Hagaon, Moses Israelis. So th this is the introduction to what are his hagaot. That is his comments, his adamant, Added, what's the word? Adamant adversion? What is that word? Uh, Adamant adversions? No, no. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't know how to pronounce the word. I shouldn't use it. Uh, in any case, uh, th these are his comments, which, uh, which uh, begin the page uh, you see there in, in Rashi's script. Now, what's interesting is that Israelis was part of this oral tradition. And basically, what a rabbi would do would be to add his own comments. Since it was an oral, flexible tradition, he could simply add his comments, and therefore, the law is according to the latest rabbis. So unlike a, a Christian tradition where the oldest text is the holiest text, in the tradition of this oral, flexible culture of Eastern European Jewry, the latest text is the most kosher, is the most useful, is the most significant, is the most holy. Essentially, when Israelis saw Cairo's text, he said, but clearly it does not reflect our traditions in the north. It doesn't reflect our Ashkenazic traditions. We need somehow to supplement that and to provide. But in so doing, in providing his Haga'ot, he had to make selective decisions. So he left out other Haga'ot. He left out other comments. He left out as the only, he also had to abridge his own comments. And what emerges, therefore, is indeed a commentary, but a commentary like the text itself, which is closed. So there is an abrupt ending that goes on here. In other words, by putting the book out in this way, two things are happening. Number one, for me, this is the quintessential early modern Jewish texts. Why? Because an Ashkenazic and a Sephardic Jew are speaking with each other. These sub-communities were so differentiated from each other in the Middle Ages. Yes, of course, Jews traveled back and forth. I'm not suggesting there wasn't any that it was totally closed off. But the degree to which a book could appear on one side, a Sephardic rabbi, on the other, an Ashkenazic rabbi, suggests indeed a kind of meeting of the minds here that reflects, that for me, is the signature of what early modern Jewish culture is about. And the second point I want to make is indeed the transformation of a pedagogic process. That is, what emerges uh, early uh, as an oral process is now arrested uh, now, I, I guess I should add, uh, the, the, before, uh, those of you will say to me, but, you know, the manuscripts stop, and is this totally closed? And, of course, I'm exaggerating and putting too much emphasis on technology, and then I get into the debate between Eisenstein and all our critics and so on. I'm aware of the fact that manuscripts still have their power and their force in this period as well. 
But at least relatively speaking, there is a change. Now Jews who want to know the law go to the Shulchan Aruch. They go to a printed Talmud. In other words, things that are written, that are, that are printed, are not easily as changed as they are. Maybe in our computer age we can fool around and change the text, but we can't do so uh, in a printed age. I remember when I was in a reform rabbinical school, um, there were guys that used to write on their pages of the Talmud. I thought that was kind of sacrilegious and sort of add things on the margins and so on and so forth. But it's a Talmud, it's a sacred book, you don't do that. Uh, and I would assume that most of the students of Rabbi Islis weren't fooling around with these texts. They were reading them as they were. But in so doing, they arrested a process which had been more flexible, had been more open, had been more transformative than it had been before. Now the book becomes important and the teacher, the oral rabbi, becomes less important. He simply can interpret what's on the pages of the book. He can't himself innovate and transform uh, simply because he knows better than the manuscript of the book that he's reading from. All right, now those uh, are by way of the first two books. I only have two more to go, so you can count your minutes already. But I have some, a little supplement in between. I want to offer now a kind of generalized commentary about this period. Some of the things I've said already, some of them I want to elaborate upon for a few more minutes. And then I want to go back and talk about my other two books, which are really favorites of mine and are not, uh, neither one of them are rabbinic. So first of all, let me uh, suggest the following. Going back to our image of the printing press of Daniel Bamborg, what I'm suggesting is that beginning in Venice and other Italian cities, but then moving eventually to the Ottoman Empire very, very shortly, and finally to the Eastern European world, and of course to Amsterdam in the north, uh, printing uh, catches on like fire within the Jewish community. Uh, you will see I'm going to be talking about a book that was published circa 1475, uh, only, what, 20, 30 years after the first printing uh, of the book in general. We are speaking about Jews seeing a wonderful discovery and utilizing it rather rapidly to enter the field of printing. What is also exciting here is that because Bamberg is involved, that should symbolize something even larger, that the enterprise of creating Hebrew books is not simply a Jewish affair. Indeed, Christians are involved as businessmen, as producers, as printers. They're involved at every stage of the game. And indeed, if they were not only if they were involved in this business, it is because they wanted a profit. And therefore, selling only to the Jewish community might not have been enough. They were also selling to Christian readers. So simultaneously with the printing of the Hebrew book is the emergence of an enormous uh, development within early modern culture, which is the culture of Christian Hebraicism of at least an elite group of Christians mastering Hebrew, reading these commentaries, taking it quite seriously, and, and certain markets are really quite open to Jewish as well as Christian readers. Amsterdam, which soon by the next century replaces Venice as the center of printing of Jewish culture, prints both for Christian readers who are buying them for the universities, for Protestant uh, uh, schools to read the commentaries and so on, but are also selling them simultaneously to Jews. In fact, the picture of Amsterdam is a really exciting picture to talk about. On the one hand, Christian Hebraists surrounding the various Jewish figures, I think most uh, significantly of Manasseh ben Israel, uh, the great uh, intellectual figure of 17th century Amsterdam and his Christian colleagues around him. But I'm also thinking about the Eastern European Jews who traveled to Amsterdam. You know what's great about Amsterdam? Everything goes, everything is free, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, brothels, marijuana, etc., and any kind of book you want to publish. I mean, you know, I, the, the other two sound more exciting, but uh, uh, in any case, you know what I mean. So Eastern European Jews would come, and they would hang out, and they would publish their sforum, their books, and then they would go back to Eastern Europe. So ironically and paradoxically, Amsterdam, where they speak Dutch or Spanish or Portuguese, that is, the Jews of Amsterdam, um, in Amsterdam becomes a major center of Yiddish printing by the 17th and the 18th century. Hundreds of Yiddish books are published there, and perhaps now that I'm speaking about Yiddish, I should make a larger claim, and that is that print has much to do with the creation of not only books in Hebrew, but also in Yiddish and Ladino. Uh, there's a time gap, Yiddish first, and then Ladino later on. But I would say the development of both of these languages and their literatures competing with Hebrew is a significant dimension of print and particularly uh, the, the degree to which 
Um, books can be sold cheaply and reach larger numbers of people, and therefore Yiddish printing becomes extremely important. The first major publications of Yiddish are also in the Veneto region in Venice. Venice has a large Ashkenazic Jewish population that comes down from Germany after 1348, after the Black Plague, and they establish themselves in Venice and Padua and throughout this whole region. And we have hundreds of, of Yiddish books published in Venice uh, simultaneous with the Hebrew books. Uh, Latin, Ladino, of course, is a, uh, a, a language that develops later on, at least in its printed version. But clearly, uh, in the 17th and the 18th century, Ladino press becomes extremely important to Jewish communities living in the Ottoman Empire, uh, and hundreds of Ladino books are published as well. So in many respects, the emergence of these three literatures is precipitated, is shaped by the printing press. Print shatters the boundaries of local culture. We talked about that already. And in many respects, I would argue that this presents a crisis for rabbinic elites. I mentioned this in the case of this fluid scribal culture arrested by print, creating a canonical text, one immune to scribal insertions, the text becoming the ultimate word, not uh, necessarily the teacher anymore. The other aspect of this is the invasion of Ashkenazic space by Sephardic books and vice versa. Leona Modena, the great preacher of Venice, for example, hears about Ashkenazic books published in Krakow, which he cites from, and the great Maral of Prague, the great rabbi of Prague, complains bitterly about the publication of a book in 1575 by Azari de Rossi, the Mayor Enayim, a book of historiographical criticism, which he argues should not be read by Jews in Eastern Europe. But almost simultaneously, he writes this comment, the book is published, and all of a sudden it reaches the Jewish community of, uh, <coughs> of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Prague. Uh, uh, what did I say? Krakow? I, I meant Prague. Uh, so Prague is, is where the Maral is from. Uh, so therefore what we have is, is really quite uh, an amazing experience that not only are books published, but people are reading them, are buying them, are acquiring them, and are citing each other, uh, both of course uh, Hebrew books, Yiddish books, uh, Ladino books, but also books written in many other languages. Uh, a friend of ours who was here at uh, the center several times, Amnon Raz Krakotskin, has written about the printing shop as another aspect of our story. Um, some would say it's speculative, but it's, it's marvelously speculative in that he suggests that uh, the printing, the printer, uh, along with the censor, often, uh, you know, the history of, of the Talmud is, is also has its dark side in the same period. In the 16th century, the Talmud is burned in Italy in 1553 by order of Pope Paul IV. Uh, soon after, however, Talmuds are allowed, but they are heavily censored. And all Jewish literature is censored. But the censor, as Amnon Raz Krakotskin very, very interestingly develops, was not necessarily an adversary of the Jew. His job was to censor, but basically what he was doing was looking for passages that refer to Christianity and somehow denigrate uh, Jesus and, and Christian faith. If he didn't find them, the book passed, so that in a certain sense, censorship, as opposed to the burning of the Talmud, is a constructive step in allowing Jews to read their own literature, to publish it, and to study it. Moreover, one could argue that, indeed, what emerges is a new Jewish literature in the 17th century, and here he may have exaggerated point, but it's still a very exciting point, that presents Judaism without denigrating the other. In other words, it's a kind of sanitized Judaism. Jude we, Jews can articulate who they are without putting down the other. Uh, now, I wish I could say the same for Christianity with respect to Judaism. That was more problematic. But nevertheless, the censor does clean up the Jewish act, so to speak. And therefore, even though Jews could denigrate Christianity, as they did in their long interaction over many centuries, uh, the printed books do not reflect that so clearly. The printing press was also a place where the censor worked together with the printer. In other words, they eliminated the mistakes even before the book was printed. And there they also worked with Jews. They also worked with people who had converted from Judaism to Christianity. In other words, it was like a multicultural little world. It was like a little place where Jews and Christians could interact uh, in, in a creative way in producing these extraordinary books that were read both by Jews and by Christians. The other aspect that I want to speak about is also the history of books on the Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. This is a very interesting story in itself, and I can just mention it in one moment. That is, 
that the Kabbalah for Jews was something they were reticent to publish in the first place for obvious reasons. These are the secrets of God. You have to be 40 years old to read the Kabbalah in the first place. And if you do, you have to read it in a mature, in a structured, in a guided way. But all of a sudden, so to speak, Christians are jumping the gun. They want to know about the esoteric parts of Judaism. And therefore, they begin to publish Kabbalistic works on their own, even without the approval and blessing of the Jews. And then the Jews are faced. What do we do? Do we print them in our accurate copies or not? Or do we simply let them do their own thing? What emerges is a debate in the middle of the 16th century between two printers and a whole group of rabbis whether to publish the Sefer HaZohar, the classical text of the Kabbalah, or not. In the end, two editions are published, and Jews begin then to publish Hebrew works on the Kabbalah. And in the 16th century, under the uh, aegis of the great Kabbalistic school of Safed of Isaac Luria, and later on, the Sabbatians, uh, those who were followers of Shabtai Tzvi, publish hundreds and hundreds of Kabbalistic works and pamphlets and books which, which clearly become part and parcel of Jewish culture. Let me mention in that respect two other aspects. So Christians have a role in encouraging and pushing Jews to publish their own works. Two other aspects that are interesting here. One is the fact that the controversies among Jews are also reflected in the history of the book. When Shabtai Tzvi, the false messianic figure, declares himself a messiah in 1666 and creates a movement antinomian against the tradition, undermining the tradition, creating a kind of revolution in Judaism, which extends for several centuries through various manifestations. What is clear about this story is that the, the news travels because of the book and specifically because of pamphlets. The wars against the Sabbateans and their opponents Particularly, the rabbinic establishment is a war, is a, is a, is a book of pamphlets, very much like the Reformation uh, and the history of, uh, of internal Christian debates are in the early modern period. The other aspect of this is the publication of popular texts. And here again, we are speaking now about secondary elites. The fact that people who are not necessarily part of that elite establishment can read these little pamphlets, books called Musser books, little books that deal with morality and ethics. Uh, these small books are now in the hands of all kinds of Jews. Women readers become important also in this period. Uh, and indeed, first books written by men for women, but eventually women themselves writing their books, their poetry, uh, their stories about their own life experiences. This happens later than the early part of the early modern period, but nevertheless, it does happen. Uh, one final aspect of this, and that is... Jews writing in, in Western languages. Jews become aware of the other, and this is reflected also in their writing um, works of apologetics. Such works as Leona Modena's Ritti, written in Italian, or Manasseh ben Israel, writing in Latin, or Isaac Arobio de Castro in Amsterdam, writing in Latin. Or the best example I have <coughs> is a wonderful work called the Discorso uh, uh, a work by the uh, Venetian rabbi uh, um, Simcha Lutzato, which is an attempt to present an economic profile of the Jewish community before the doge, the government of Venice, in order to prevent an expulsion in the, the third decade of, uh, of the 17th century. And in this book is a remarkable portrait of what Jews are like. He calls Jews, there are three kinds of Jews, he says. There are rabbis who study the law, there are philosophers and there are Kabbalists. And in each case, the way he presents them, the way he divides them, reflects, of course, to try to understand Judaism within a Catholic Italian context. So when he gets, for example, to the Kabbalah, it is not that the Jews study their mysteries, but their mysteries are like Neoplatonists and like Pythagoreans and like esoteric magic, so that you really can understand the essence of Judaism if you know these other fields as well, and you correlate and integrate them into one. So therefore, what happens, of course, is a new presentation, self-presentation of Judaism for the non-Jew, which in the long run is picked up and read by Jews themselves. Uh, my later books that deal with England, actually, the story is really quite remarkable. Assimilated Jews in England in the 18th century are reading these apologetic works, works written for Christians because they have no access anymore to the Talmud and to rabbinic texts. 
And therefore, they are learning about themselves through an image a Jew presented of the Jewish community, which was really meant for Catholic eyes. So it's a very interesting story that emerges here. All, again, engendered through uh, the, the culture of the book. Now, I think I'm talking too much, so I've got to go on to my last two books. So here they go. <clears throat> so uh, you're first looking at... Here, I'm going to go like this. So that's the first edition, and that's a later edition, which is prettier because it has color. But um, let's look at the first edition first. Okay. This is a book that I love to speak about. For me, it's a signature of Italian Jewish culture. This is a book which, I, uh, which is called The Book of the Honeycombs Flow. It is written by an Italian rabbi named Judah Messer Leon, uh, and it's written circa 1475. Um, it's a work obviously written in the first years of Hebrew printing. And it is the first book which is written in the lifetime of an author by the author himself, his own work. All right, that takes a certain chutzpah, audacity, temerity, to publish, to have enough sense of the power of print. In 1475, this is written. Uh, and to publish your own work. I mean, the hell with anybody else's work. I mean, what are the other works that are printed in this period of time? You have Rashi, and you have Ibn Ezra, and you have Maimonides, all the great classical works. But who would think of Judah Messer Leon in that group of, uh, of scholars? Now, what is this book about? The book is revolutionary. It is a rhetoric. It is a handbook of rhetoric. It is written in the climate of Italian humanism of the 15th century. And it, what it does is basically copy and translate 90% of the book from Cicero and Quintilian. And, put it, and it is written for the Jewish students of Mantua who are learning to be doctors as well, teaching them that in order to be a real intellectual, you have to know how to speak. You have to know how to communicate. You have to know how to remember things quickly. You have to be quick on your feet. If you can't do this, if you can't move your hands like I and Tom like to do. Remember, you were doing the same thing, right? We both have hands, right? Uh, if you can't do that, I don't know if the Quintilian ever said that, but nevertheless, I say it. Uh, <laughs> what is clear is that um, uh, a Jew needs to know this stuff. So here is the integration of the humanist curriculum made famous in the 15th century into Jewish culture. But why is this a Jewish book if it's simply a copy job? Because 10% of the book is original. Why is it original? Because he takes biblical uh, citations and he puts them as illustrations of the points he's making about rhetoric. And he's also implying, in fact, explicitly stating the following. That if you really want to know rhetoric, don't go to... Quintili to Rome or to Greece, but Jerusalem. Who are the great rhetoricians? Obviously, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. And therefore, what this man is doing is what we could call the genesis of that wonderful course that's usually given in English departments, the Bible as literature. Taking the Western canon and somehow, either artificially or not, trying to take this, this Middle Eastern text and to try to find the rules of its composition from the Western uh, uh, canonical literary canon and trying to impose them on the text. In other words, to read it through Western eyes. Essentially, therefore, the Bible becomes a text which really is the foundational text of Western literature. But what is also striking here is he, what he's saying to his, his readers is that you really can't read the Bible simply anymore. You've got to learn rhetoric first, then go back and read the Bible, and after you read the Bible, you will see uh, the Bible in a different light. Because now you will see insights that were never there before. In other words, your academic expertise, your academic experience, by asking the right questions, by opening yourself up to a broader methodology, will allow you to understand the biblical text that, in, in a way that ne never appeared before. He also makes the claim, of course, that since rhetoric is a Jewish discipline, Every discipline is also Jewish. It's just that the fact that the Jews were, they had it all, they lost it, they were sent to exile, and in the diaspora they lost it all. But essentially, by reading Cicero and Quintilian, I'm simply reclaiming what was mine in the first place. And therefore, perhaps a orthodox apologetic, whatever you want to call it, it's an attempt on the part of a Jew to argue for the secular sciences, for knowledge from the outside, Ultimately, since it's all Jewish, this kind of self-aggrandizement, since it's all Jewish, everything is permissible and everything should be read along the way. Now, whether he really believes in that myth or not, I can't say, but clearly here is a wonderful justification. And the usage of uh, non-Jewish culture 
in order to enhance the spirituality, the intellectual integrity of Judaism itself. But the most important thing for our purposes here is that he knew this was a new and exciting revolutionary platform and therefore let us publish it. And let us put this out as a book so that it will become a rhetorical handbook for Jews who read this afterwards. Whether he had the impact that he hoped, I can't say. There are a number of instances where this book is cited. And of course, uh, this is the era of the Italian Jewish sermon as it is the Italian Christian sermon. So that we have many people who are influenced by this kind of rhetoric and, and think about their presentation in delivering sermons in synagogues and elsewhere. All right, so I'll show you this copy. And just quickly, this copy is <clears throat> a more recent copy from Vienna, 1863, by the famous uh, Adolf Jelinek uh, was the publisher, along with Isaac Mannheimer. And here is a much more beautiful copy, which I have in my own library, um, which uh, brings this work to, to light. Uh, more recently, uh, Harry Rabinowitz, who taught rhetoric at Cornell for many years, published his own English translation of this book with his own commentary. Uh, for me, it was one of the most exciting moments in the history of Jewish publication, uh, but I was told by the editor of Cornell University Press that it sold the least books in the history of the press. Uh, so it didn't have a wide cachet, but I certainly bought my two copies. Uh, in any case, uh, that's the history. I think he sold more from the first edition than Harry Rivett sold a couple of years ago when he published the book. All right, finally, I come to my last book. That is not a self-portrait, neither one of them. Uh, but it is written by uh, a man that I just got done talking about in my, uh, in my seminar, uh, where my Penn students were reading this text in Hebrew. Um, this is um, a text called Maase Tuvia. Um, it, it, it was written by a graduate of the University of Padua, a medical doctor, and it is indeed a, um, a medical encyclopedia, a medical handbook, a medical textbook very much like the medical textbooks written in the 18th century. The story of Tuvia Cohen, and there is his portrait on the left. Um, if Peter Stalybrass was here, he would notice immediately where his, his fingers are. You see that? <clears throat> I guess that's pretty common, right, Roger? In other words, to have, he, he's obviously, uh, show, uh, he's keeping certain places in the book that he wants to get to, so he puts his fingers become bookmarks, basically. You see that on the left, and the right is uh, his, uh, his globe. Uh, and otherwise, he looks rather Ashkenazic, right? Uh, uh, I guess handsome, I mean, in a certain, if you like that kind of beauty. Um, in any case, um, the, the idea of printing his picture, his portrait, rabbinic portraits, is, again, a creation of print. Uh, and clearly, one of the aspects of this interesting book, of course, are the illustrations. And the one, of course, on the right is the most interesting. It goes through, it is called um, uh, Bayit Hadash. <clears throat> what he do, this, this, does is describe uh, all of the organs of the, bi of the body by using, by paralleling him with three, three stories of the house. Um, as far as I know, this is an original um, drawing. Uh, several people have worked on it and tried to figure out where its origin comes from. There are many illustrations in the book that seem to have come from, uh, uh, from other Christian sources, but I don't know where he got this one. Um, I have this on the, uh, uh, as a copy of, uh, as, a, as, as the cover of one of my books, and I also found actually in Jerusalem a t-shirt with that, uh, with, with a thing on the right, which I treasure. Um, but in any case, the story of Tuvia very quickly, and we have to end, so I'm going to, I'm going to come bring this to a close, is basically an Ashkenazic Jew from Poland, who with a friend make their way uh, to Frankfurt de Oder, and they tried to get into the university there, and they convinced, I guess through bribery or otherwise, to allow two Jews into this university that has no Jews. <clears throat> and they managed to last for about a year in this university, and he describes how difficult it was and how the Christian students were constantly engaged in theological disputations to ridicule them and Judaism. And finally, without any other choice, he, go, he crosses the border into Italy, and there they are welcomed in the University of Padua. Padua became the first major university in Europe to accept Jews en masse. Uh, one of my uh, strong uh, interests for years, uh, particularly before I came to Penn, was the study of Jews, Jewish medical students at the University of Padua. Medical medicine is a kind of mediation between high and low culture, between external and internal culture, 
The first education, of course, where do you go if you're a Jew in, in, in medieval or an early modern university? You can't go to the, the school of law, which of course is heavily uh, canon law. You can't go to the school of theology, so you go to the school of medicine. So therefore, medicine uh, becomes, in this period of time, uh, an important dimension of a large group of Jews coming from the Veneto region. Padua is about 10 kilometers from, from Venice. But Jews are also coming from all over the world. So we have Sephardic Jews, we have German Jews, we have Polish Jews coming down as Tuvia Kohen to study at the University of Padua. There he engaged a, uh, in a school outside, right across in the Jewish quarter, right near the medical school of Padua, where he studied Latin and Talmud all day long in a kind of Jewish preparatory school, which he describes in the introduction to this work. And then finally he enters the university itself. Um, did Jews hang out with Poles and with Germans? It's really hard to say. They probably hung around themselves and had their kosher meals back in the Jewish quarter. But for five years, he managed to complete uh, some very serious studies, which included humanistic medicine, that, that is mastering the classics, not only studying medicine, but also a, a broad liberal arts uh, uh, curriculum. And then finally, uh, two years in a laboratory, and then he completed this work. In 1708, by this time, he had come to the Ottoman Empire, where he became one of the chief physicians of the sultan in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so here we have an Ashkenazic Jew who makes his way to Padua, the Ottoman Empire, and he eventually dies in the land of Israel. At this point, he sends back his manuscript, and it is published in Venice in 1708. It is a kind of Dr. Spock. I don't know if that means anything to you anymore. It used to mean a lot to me. Uh, but in, uh, of, of Jewish medicine uh, for the 18th century. Uh, but it is also an arrogant Dr. Spock, because he says, that, you know, who are all these stupid charlatans, these Jews that think they know medicine simply on the basis of their own experience dealing with sick people? You have to go to a university like me and bust your chops to really be able to know enough so that you can be a serious physician. So therefore, he presents himself in, in a very elaborate way. It is also a work of Jewish advocacy. In the beginning of the text, he talks about the fact that, look, people think we're stupid. We used to be called an Am Chacham V'Navon, a wise and discerning people, but look at us now. But I'm going to show these non-Jews how smart I am by publishing a book as good as theirs. So indeed, this book is, while it is a medical book, is a book that is very much embedded in Jewish cultural concerns. In this same book is a long description of Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah. Why? Because that's embarrassing. Because enthusiastic crazies like these messi messianic figures are killing the image of Judaism. The Christians are making fun of us. What we need is a sober and rational image of Judaism, which one can find in this book of mine called Maase Tuvia. So these are four books. It's not a complete story by any means. It's just a small sampling. But beginning with the two great classics, Mikrot Gedolot, the book of exegesis on the Bible, um, and uh, the Shulchan Aruch, the great code of Jewish law, and ending with a work on rhetoric and work on science. It gives you some inkling on, on what, how exciting this particular field is and how much we can learn about the transformation of Jewish culture. Here we're speaking about the expansion of cultural horizons. We're speaking about new roles that book, books play within the culture of, uh, of European Jewry in the, in the 16th and 17th century. I guess the final question, of course, would be, which is not a subject of my lecture, if technology is so important in this period for Jews, uh, what does it mean uh, in terms of looking at Jewish culture from the computer uh, age? Uh, what could we learn about the nature of Jewish culture? Something that's really very interesting here when I was thinking about the subject is to what degree traditional Jews, Orthodox Jews, have captured computer technology in terms of disseminating Judaism. It's really quite interesting, and I think that parallel is very much a parallel here. Uh, unlike the Arabic book, which took, what, 150 years, 200 years after print, before before the first Arab book, there was a certain inhibition within Islamic culture to produce books. Jews had no hesitation. This became an immediate uh, gratifying technology which transformed their Jewish culture. And although certain rabbis were resistant to the fact of this flow of information, ultimately they accepted, they succumbed to it and became part and parcel of their culture. Uh, similarly, in the computer age, despite uh, how traditional and orthodox a person may be, the technology of the computer has become a, a major factor in 
making Jews traditional. Uh, the traditional daf yomi, which is the, um, a Jew should study a page, both sides of the Talmud every day, you know, until he completes it after a seven year cycle. You can do your daf yomi on computer. You can even converse with others who are studying the text and so on. Uh, so there, you can you know, be walking with your smartphone uh, and studying uh, the Talmud uh, as you walk the street. Um, I never tried it, but um, uh, I guess it's possible. Uh, so in, th in that respect, it says something about the larger Jewish culture uh, in its openness uh, and in its particular way in which it used this technology uh, to further its own interests and to establish itself in the larger culture of early modern Europe. So I've taken you on a tour. Uh, I have no more agendas than that. Uh, I hope this has interested uh, you in, in appreciating um, a, a subject which is usually not seen from this perspective. Uh, and that we can also integrate the story of Judaism into the larger story of the history of print. Thank you very much. Sure. Easy ones, easy questions. Yes, you've got to be loud. Stand up and be loud. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> good. Um, so that, uh, I threw a sentence in the middle and I said, I'm aware of the fact that the manuscript still is around. Uh, and I would have got a lot uh, more of that from the specialists, uh, you know, who, who would immediately counter me. And I don't want to sound too much like, uh, you know, uh, thinking that everything relies on technology. Uh, people make choices, they read, they study, the way they study and so on <clears throat> is not simply, and I don't want to reduce everything to the printing press. If I'm, I'm obviously uh, excited about this aspect, but I, I, don't want, I don't want to overdo it. And I think there, there are plenty of, of, of corners of Jewish culture where the manuscripts continue to emerge and so on. My only evidence would be primarily how well these books sold. In other words, the marketplace of these books. And works like the Shulchan Aruch and the Mikrot Gedolot really did well. I mean, lots and lots of editions. The Shulchan Aruch, right from then until the, the present, becomes, I, I don't, you know, I, I can't recall any major study of a, actually, you know, this subject, it, you know, for example, taking one book. We, we have a few examples of people who have studied the reception of one book over a long period of time. But we know that these are standard books of the Jewish library. I can certainly say in the case of Messer Leon, the last two books, they don't have the same circulation. Although, Tuvia Kohen, we're speaking about at least 25 editions. But I would say there were hundreds of editions of, of Mikrot Gedolot. Now, and, and clearly, they were sold. And we have, uh, I don't have the figures in front of me. But these were standard ways in which Jews were studying these texts. Uh, but, of course, I, I, I need to say more than that. I need to present to you the statistics and, 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 and the features of this. Uh, but it, it's certainly possible that, uh, that manuscripts were still around and that oral teachers were still doing their things uh, and that uh, indeed, at least in the initial... And, and also another uh, perhaps expression of this is the amount of, uh, of controversy over the initial texts. The fact that indeed they are succeeding and that are people that are using them and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm not willing... I, I certainly would not uh, argue that uh, the printed uh, pr pr uh, book... Uh, it, it reigned supreme from the 16th century on. I think it would, it would probably have its ups and downs and it would be a more gradual process. But certainly I think I'm on quite strong ground in suggesting the Shulchan Aruch as a standard text. 
Uh, Jews walk around with kitzur shulchan aruchs now, little, little ones, you know. They can even put them in their little back pocket. In other words, this book is, is like the, the basic reference point. You can even avoid going to the Talmudic page because it is a quick digest of what you have to do as a traditional Jew. Uh, and therefore, it becomes absolutely critical. It has a utilitarian aspect, which is really quite uh, extraordinary. On the other hand, I just thought of one example that really would counter this. Uh, I just f uh, f uh, finished reading uh, Elisheva Karlbach's book on the calendar, uh, a printing of, uh, of the calendar in the early modern period. And there is a good example of <coughs> calendars are printed, almanacs are printed, and so on. So it's a really, it's a lovely book. And the printing press obviously, again, disseminates these calendars and they sell widely and so on. On the other hand, the calendar also becomes an art form. And the manuscript calendar is a very important part of that story as well. Uh, and similarly, we can turn to certain manuscripts. Uh, uh, our friend from Amsterdam gave a whole series of lectures a couple of years ago, right? Right, on, on, uh, on a certain kinds of manuscripts that, that, that continue for a long, long period of time uh, and particularly become artistic creations in their own right and therefore valued because of their beauty, which is, is simply cannot be reproduced by the printed book. Uh, but I think your point is well taken. And I think these, you know, after... <clears throat> moving in the direction of putting everything on print, uh, we must move away from it now and sort of look at, uh, at, 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 at how things are more nuanced uh, and, and more complicated than our original presentation. But I still would argue relatively, if not, uh, that there is a big change here uh, and that to minimize that change, to argue it's not significant, uh, would really be to, to miss a great deal. Um, I guess what I can, the, the most impressive aspect, and this is what I'm, I'm actually you know, teaching this course now on science, is how fast people in the early modern period read books that just came out. You know, it's, it's, medieval Jews read other things besides their own tradition. <clears throat> but the access to a book, I mean, when they quote, or, or, or you know, it, it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, I can turn, I can pick up a 17th century Hebrew text. Um, and I, actually, Tuvia Kohen is the best example of this. Uh, I spoke uh, in my class about how he discovers the chemical philosophy uh, of Willis, a center of a group of scholars who were writing in Amsterdam and in England on a new therapies regarding medicine. He reads their books within 10 years of their publication. He is writing it in the Ottoman Empire. It's being published in, in Italy. And these are books that are being published in England. Uh, that would suggest, indeed, a, a different kind of communicative network than what had previously existed. But I think your point is well taken. I'm glad you made it. Tom. Um, David, I ask a question uh, <clears throat> of complete and utter ignorance. Uh, uh, but you can well, dispatch with it quickly if you want. Um, I was fascinated by your discussion of the Christian Hebrews and their, their um, uh, use of these uh, 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 Hebrew texts. Um, and I'm wondering if it went the other way around. That is, were there contemporaries who were translating uh, um, uh, these Hebrew texts One of the reasons why the, the I can't remember his name, the doctor Hakohen was was writing his medical works was to transform the image of the Jew, um, presumably not just within the Jewish community itself, but more widely. So did his work actually get picked up and read other than by the Christian? Uh, you 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 sort of gave me a cur, cur, uh, what's a softball. I, I mean, it's a question that I can now open up a whole another discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I mentioned the apologetic works like Luzzato, like Manasseh ben Israel, and so on, that are writing already <clears throat> in Italian, Latin, English. Uh, <clears throat> Modena's work is translated into about 20 languages. So it's French, and then it's English, and it's all kinds. And then, by the way, the illustrations of Picard uh, are, are accompany the Modena text when we get to England, so that we have illustrations of Jewish holidays along with descriptions of the Jewish holidays. So that, that obviously is written for a non-Jewish audience. What I was saying, sort of parenthetically, is that the Jews of England by the 18th century are reading these books as well because they're learning about their Jewish holidays through these books. So because they, they're so ignorant of their own Jewish tradition. But let me give you an even better example, which comes from another book that I, I worked on. Uh, <clears throat> and that is the discovery um, uh, by Christians of the great classic of they don't get to the Talmud directly, but they get first to the Mishnah. Remember, the Mishnah was composed around 200 CE. It is the first layer of the Talmud itself. 
The Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah. Together it makes up the, the, the there are two Talmuds, one in the land of Israel, one in, in Babylonia. Uh, but the Talmud itself, but the Mishnah is more or less simultaneous with Jesus, with the time of Jesus and with his disciples. I mean, it's more or less. I mean, it, goes, it reflects oral traditions that go back obviously before 200. So the Christians become interested in the Mishnah. And uh, beginning, actually we have one of our graduate students is working on this now, uh, Manasseh ben Israel in, uh, in Amsterdam publishes uh, a Mishnah together with a group of Christian Hebraists that is Minukad, that has uh, pointing uh, so you can read it more easily. It's for an amateur that is reading this text. He publishes part of it, it doesn't do well, but uh, several people pick this up. By the end of the 17th century, a professor at the University of Amsterdam named Suranusius publishes a folio edition of the Mishnah in Latin, the entire text in Latin, together with the two standard commentaries of the Mishnah. One is by Maimonides, the other is by Bert Nora, uh, a, a 15th, uh, 16th century Italian Jew. And Cernusius puts his own commentary. I mean, that's real ecumenicism, right on the same page. So you're reading Jewish, Christian, and it's all there. This book is then picked up by a group of disciples of Cernusius and then published, not completely, but, uh, but several of its Masech Torah are published in English, with English commentary. Tractates. So, uh, uh, tractates, right, thank you. Uh, so, um, the, the tractates of the Mishnah. So what emerges, therefore, is what Arthur likes to call Christian rabbinism, not only Christian Hebraicism. In other words, the Christians first rediscover the biblical text and what they think are related to that ancient biblical world which they need to, to rediscover and, and bring and, and replenish their own uh, cultural creativity. Uh, biblical exegesis and so on, but then they discover rabbinics as well. And rabbinics then enters the Christian mind and they begin to study this uh, as part of a way of getting closer to understanding ancient Christianity. This is also during the period of the explosion of interest in the ancient world and all kinds of sectarian groups, all kinds of scrolls and editions are being published in this period of time. And what emerges therefore is a whole field of study by Christians of rabbinic texts. I could go on and on with this, but I, I won't. But the point is um, that, indeed, Jews are becoming aware of the other, not only the Jewish other, as we said, but also the Christian other, and more and more Jews are writing. Or, or as I, this example I gave you, it was Jews collaborating with Christians, but ultimately Christians are doing it themselves. One of the problems Jews have as a result of Christian Hebraicism is that they are losing, uh, are they the sole uh, readers of these texts? No, not any longer. They have to share the monopoly with Christians, who in some respects argue we can do a better job with these texts because Jews haven't polluted them, they haven't corrupted them. So the Christian reader therefore challenges the Jewish reader, which is, again, part of our story of, of the history of these books. Yes? Uh, you said something about, in addition to like publishing your own portrait, what do we know from primary texts, letters, diaries, anything about somebody like Rabbi Carroll? How self-conscious were these authors of what they were doing in the context of the previous oral and manuscript traditions? Uh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> <they're clears throat> they, actually, if you look, I mean, they, they sort, of, sort of say it parenthetically, but there are a lot of people who are aware of the power of the printing press and its use. Messer Leo never mentions why he's publishing his book, but obviously... He understands what he's doing precisely. Uh, Cairo, too, in publishing his code, was obviously trying to seek certain authority. But we have comments galore, particularly over the controversy over the rabbinic Bible <coughs> and some of these early publications, about the fact that these many editions are not necessary are bringing dishonor uh, against uh, you know against the traditional way of Jewish life. So it is seen as threatening. Yes, there are many comments that do appear in the pages of early Jewish works, some of them in manuscript, which refer to print. And so there is a self-consciousness. There is an awareness that there is change out there. Uh, perhaps not as radical as our own change in the last 30, 40 years, but nevertheless, it is a change that is quite significant. Uh, after a certain point, of course, uh, then uh, uh, authors become self-conscious of not only publishing the book, but how they want to publish a book. Uh, a number of weeks ago, I presented in the History of the Book Seminar a text written by a Jew at the end of the 18th century that goes on for pages describing <clears throat> how he wants the book published with certain print. Don't finish words at the end of a page, but you have to have the complete word. You can't break it up in the middle. 
Uh, it has to be presented in a certain order. You, can't, you have to read this text and this text together and so on. In other words, he's giving specific instructions to the printer. This becomes, again, a part of the culture which has become uh, a part of, of Judaism after a certain time, so it's sort of taken for granted. So now the technique of how one does this uh, becomes the self-conscious part. Uh, more to say on that, but that's a big question that you asked. Yes? Um, you alluded to some of the business side of this, and I just asked you to embellish just a little bit more, especially in the earlier, the 15th century text. Um, what did it cost to, uh, to distribute? And uh, when you talk about multiple editions, how many runs were there, in the, you know, how many books in the edition? And the last question is, with a Christian publisher or a Christian printer, did this uh, allow him to spread this around without having a discriminatory uh, approach, uh, which, which maybe is just a Jewish uh, printer would, would hit a wall from the Christian side? Those are great questions, and and now you're going to uh, now you begin to uh, reveal some of my ignorance because uh, when you ask these nitty gritty questions, I'm I'm going to have a harder time with them. Um, but let me just use it to sort of back up and just say one thing that I left out, and that is. Uh, one of the, the pro just as in other cultures, but certainly in Jewish culture, what emerges out of this is a group of people who make their living printing books. Mocher Sforim is the uh, Yiddish or the Hebrew word. Uh, these guys are peddlers of books and they go from place to place. Uh, and they become part of a popular culture and they uh, create also their own little pamphlets and books so that there's, I, I refer to secondary elites, even tertiary elites. These are, are individuals who are essentially products of the book culture and are there to sell books. Sometimes their own creations, uh, sometimes they deal with little manuals about living, about morality and ethics and so on. Uh, their sermons, for example, uh, preachers. Be What's interesting is not only is this the age of Jewish preaching, it's also the age of, Jew of printing uh, sermons. And sermons sell like wildfire. They still do today. You know, every rabbi worth his while has to publish uh, his or her sermons out there. You know, you have to get them out, get out the word. Uh, and this becomes a, a popular form of teaching. Um, so on the one hand, we have these multiple tomes of the Talmud and the Mikrot Gedolot, which obviously cost a lot, and I can't give you a, a price tag. I, I don't know. I, Martha probably knows more about this than I do. Um, but uh, they obviously are enough to keep these guys in business. Uh, and they do quite well, and they are sold over and over again. Uh, the other stuff, I mean, the more, you know, the, the, this, this more popular cultural material uh, is also out there, uh, but obviously these guys are making a living from it, and they create essentially this, this, this culture on the move, because they're, they're always, you know, bargaining with their potions and with their folk medicine, along with a, a group of, of, of books that they are selling. Uh, so this is, is really a part of early modern culture in, in, a, in a full sense. As far as how the negotiation went on between a Christian printer uh, and, and, uh, and the Jews who were working for them, or did he have, he obviously had more uh, control, but nevertheless there were censors that he had to deal with. The censor became a part of the publishing industry, particularly uh, in Italy, but also uh, in Geneva and other places. Um, and uh, Amsterdam, of course, was relatively more free, so he had to deal with uh, the larger culture and the larger law. Whether he could take advantage of his Jewish authors and publish what he wanted or when he wanted and so on, there are probably cases of this nature. Um, but again, this is an area that needs to be explored in greater detail by using ex actually archival materials from these printing presses to reconstruct the, the kinds of relationships that went on between Jews and Christians. But a lot of those questions, uh, either I'm ignorant of or they need to be uh, uh, studied more in terms of research. Good, good questions, thank you. Uh, Peter. Just a very quick question. <clears throat> Was it expected then that the censors would know Hebrew? Oh yeah. In fact, most of the censors were former Jews. They were uh, what are called uh, derogatorily mishumadim, or those who have left the faith. Uh, and one of the ways in which, con I mean, converts were hired, uh, you know, for all kinds of purposes. Uh, the, the, the most exalted way a convert could survive as a Christian was be to work for the church uh, and to become a specialist, so to speak, on his former co-religionists. Uh, but clearly in the printing industry, the, this was all done by Mishum Adim. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, the Jewish books that I studied in England, where there are hardly any Jews, most of the literacy, the Jewish literacy, was done by converts. In other words, 
um, when the Christians in the 7th, 18th century come up with this ridiculous plan of putting out their own Hebrew Bible that'll be, that'll be better than the Hebrew one based uh, you know, on, uh, on, on hundreds of years of tradition, they hire uh, a group of, uh, of uh, mishumadim, of converts, uh, to essentially find them old manuscripts, which are really not old manuscripts at all, and try to create their own uh, uh, Old Testament. Not, not the New Testament, but their Old Testament. Uh, so in this respect, this is another aspect of our story, the history of Jewish-Christian relations, and particularly the convert as a, a mediator, an intermediate between Jewish and Christian cultures. Yes. The early printers also had to create or had created for them their various time bases. This was not <laughs> Latin Roman alphabets don't work. And it was pretty early. I mean Latin published in the Greek. And they're nice time bases. They had Greek by that time. They had so there had Absolutely. Right, right. I'm glad you mentioned Plantin because I love the well, Plantin uh, in Antwerp. But you know, uh, Bomberg was Plant's, Plantin's student, so the, the, the direct relationship okay. between him and, yeah. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're, we're finished? You want to finish? Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, you're absolutely right. In other words, uh, indeed, the, the economic aspect, which I'm obviously the weakest on in terms of describing it to you, uh, is a very important part of our story. Uh, uh, and particularly, at what point do we get to illustrations and all of the rest? Uh, these were elaborate affairs. And uh, particularly when you're publishing a work like the Talmud or like Mikroti uh, Lod, which are such sanctified books in their own right, uh, you clearly need um, um, uh, the finances to put this out. Uh, so these were extraordinary enterprises, um, which, uh, again, I, I, I don't really have the answer. I'm, I'm sure other people have worked on this. Uh, of how these kinds of funds were raised. Certainly, uh, we have lists of people who signed up to buy the books in advance, which were, 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 were very important in, in, in supporting this enterprise. Uh, and clearly, uh, that, that is quite common. You often see in Hebrew books and Yiddish books and so on, large lists of subscribers in the back that have, that have purchased these books. Pardon me? You see that in early publishing years. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, but clearly, um, we are speaking about something which clearly, ultimately, is a business issue. And uh, in other words, the, the success of the printed book, I would again argue, is the fact that it's sold. Um, is not a small thing. You guys uh, had enough? Uh, I did. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, I